Hey, get ready to absorb the infectious energy of Curtis Zimmerman today. He's a keynote speaker and best-selling author of the book Life at Performance Level. He talks to us today about how to write our script for our lives, cast our show wisely, and also fail successfully. Curtis has impacted easily over a million people with his speaking, which is ironic because he started his career as an award-winning mime. He breaks down for us several passionate pivot points in his career and how putting forward his real resume instead of his resume was a benefit for everybody involved. Buckle up and get ready for Curtis Zimmerman. Curtis, welcome to the podcast. Oh, excited to be here. How are we doing today, gentlemen? Great. Great. Fantastic. Happy to have you. If you could give our listeners and viewers on uh, YouTube a bit of a tour of who you are and what you do today and maybe even a little bit about how you got here. Absolutely. Well, first off, let me just thank you both for inviting me on the show. Love entrepreneurs, love entrepreneurship. And uh, I am one of the few people that I'm, I'm in my 50s now, and I've never had a real job. I've never worked for another person in my entire life. So uh, I've been an entrepreneur since I was 12 and a half years old. So when I got my first job, it was in a place called Old Town Mall in Torrance, California. And I started uh, performing when I was 12 and a half. And uh, I worked as a mime and a juggler and a fire eater and a magician for 25 years, uh, starting at 12 and a half, worked at the mall. Then I did amusement parks for nine years. I worked at Universal Studios and a place called Marineland and Aquatic Park like SeaWorld. Did that for about nine years. Then I worked on cruise ships, traveled the world, been to about 50 countries in my life, traveling, performing. And that's uh, when I met my wife. Uh, it was a love boat for us. And she was from this place called Xenia, Ohio, which is near Cincinnati. And uh, I moved there about 30 years ago to be with the love of my life and it was the first big pivot as an entrepreneur. There wasn't really a lot of work for me as a performer. So I started working in the schools and then I started doing more teacher in services. And then that turned into my next career. And what you have to do is look at what you're doing and then say, hmm, what else could I do differently to stay employed <laughs> as somebody that's, you know, you employ yourself basically. And that's how I got into my next career. And my next career was slowly, these teacher in services went well. And they started saying more and more, wow, we'd love to have you as a guest speaker. And then I started doing colleges as a keynote speaker. And after that, I did corporate. And I've been doing a speaking. Uh, and now I'm a best-selling author and all the things you have to do to be a speaker. I did that for about 20 years. And uh, so now I'm also doing coaching and things like that. So that's kind of the really fast onboard of uh, kind of my background as being somebody that understands the security uh, is a mindset. And everyone who's listening, any of your friends that say you're crazy to be an entrepreneur, I want you to always remind them of uh, if you work for someone else and you wear the wrong outfit or say the wrong word, you can be fired by one person that day. But if I have a hundred speeches, there isn't one person in the world that can fire me and I'm going to make my mortgage either way because I have a hundred streams of income. So I truly believe I have more job security than somebody that works for a big company like Procter & Gamble. So that's my, you know, my mindset I hope to share today with everybody out there. You're right and they're wrong. Well, you'd have to get fired a hundred times, Curtis. Exactly. I got to suck at a lot of shows and uh, hopefully I can produce more than what they want, which leads to 200 shows, which leads to 600 shows and so on and so on. Can you talk us through, you went from performing on a cruise ship to then the transition to all of a sudden you're doing speaking with groups and colleges and the transition to corporate and then your coat like can you talk us through some of those transitions in your career absolutely so uh as a performer basically what i learned when i worked for amusement parks was i i was literally being paid to practice so somebody paid me to go eight hours a day five days a week for seven years to go and practice my craft 
So when I decided I wanted to get into the speaking industry, I thought, where could I go where somebody can pay me to practice? And what that looked like for me was the college market. Because if I went to Northwest Louisiana State and I sucked, nobody would ever know. But if you go to Coca-Cola and you stink, you're never going back to Coca-Cola. So that's why for about five years, I literally got paid to practice my speech. And I spoke to about a half a million college students all over the United States. But that really was my same mindset, taking that same model and utilizing it in order to build the next stage of my career. So that was my transition. My goal was always to do corporate. And once I had that, that show down and I had the credibility from writing a book and all of the shows I did in colleges, many of my first corporate events happened because Colonel Beal was there dropping his son off at Florida State University and he had to sit through this damn thing called new student orientation. And I was the keynote speaker and he was like, wow, you should come to you know Shaw Air Force Base because I have a lot of young folks that need to get pumped up too. So that's really how I did all the colleges, but because the parents were in the audience, they slowly said, wow, come, come to P&G, come to Coca-Cola, come to Disney World. Come to." So that's really how I transitioned from the next thing, which was colleges, into the corporate market. So it was really not even just paid to practice. You were paid to practice while marketing to your next audience. Absolutely, that's yes. Cool. Can you talk to us about when you started uh, with your corporate engagements, what was your core message that you were hired most often to deliver? And how has that evolved? Wow, that's a great question. And it's something I think a lot of entrepreneurs run into as a stopping place. And that's because they think they have to have the perfect thing, the perfect product, the perfect speech, the perfect whatever it is. And what I'm telling you is, you know, there's something about shipping, there's something about getting in the marketplace and working it, and you never know what that path is going to be in a year from now or five years from now, and you have to stay fluid, and that's why I would say the path that I took, I really let the path open up for me as I went. So when I did the colleges, I wasn't thinking that, oh, all the parents in the audience were, they're paying for the kids to go to college somehow, they must work for big companies. That wasn't my thinking, but that is actually how it evolved into that. And the main message I've done for corporate is uh, based off my best-selling book, Life at Performance Level. And I can give you a quick, you know, real quickly what that message is really about. And yeah. it really holds true for everyone that's listening. Yeah. And that is, the first thing as a performer you have to do if you're a one-man show like me is you have to sit quietly and you have to write a script. What do you want the show you're going to produce on stage to be? Now, in our life, I say if all the things it takes to write a show on stage, if I could transfer those principles into my life, I could try to live my life at performance level. So the first thing I have to do is write a script. You know, so many people spend their entire life rereading old scripts. I'm the person I am today because of what happened yesterday, because of the neighborhood I grew up in, because my dad used to smack me in the back of the head when I, you know, ate, talked with my mouth full. Those are all called old scripts. But if you want to write the next chapter of your life, your business, your relationships, you have to stop rereading old scripts. So I'm going to write a show called My Life. I'm in charge. I'm the director. Some people say, well, Curtis, you know, I, I'm a giver. And I get that. I've been married for about 30 years, but I'm still the star of the show, my show called Curtis Zimmerman Show, because I'm the only person that's going to be in every moment of my life, just like all of our listeners. You're going to go to sleep with you every morning, wake up with you, you know, every morning, wake up with you, go to sleep with you every night. You better like the company because you're the star of the show called your life. The next thing is you got to cast your show wisely. This is a really hard one, especially people that are entrepreneurs that want to give and they want to make a change in the world. And that is, you have to give the crazy makers fewer lines in your life. And I'm sorry about if I'm talking about your mom. You got to let it go, man. So you got to give the crazy people fewer lines. Give the healthy, whole, amazing people that are going to help you in your life, in your, your career, more lines to create the next chapter. Also, I talk a lot about the only way you're ever going to get where you want to go is if you know the key to success. And that's when I pass out 2,000 sets of juggling balls. 
and I teach the entire audience how to juggle because the only way you can learn to juggle is if you're willing to drop the ball. I call it failing successfully. And in business, when we fail, we call it innovation. <laughs> and as people, when we fail, we call it, I'm a failure. Failing is an event, not a person. And if you don't like to fail, do not be an entrepreneur because the person down the street who is failing will take your market share. So everyone learns to juggle because the process says, cast your show, be the star, don't be afraid of failure. And now we play Simon Says because the only way you can change your grow and become is if you're able to stop right in the middle of your real life and think about what you're doing with your body and say with your mouth before you do it. So I can get 2,000 people out in about six minutes in Simon Says, and that's because we just react to things. And if you want to change and grow and become, you have to stop reacting and literally be an actor and act the way you want to be seen as a successful entrepreneur. So those are some of the things that I cover in my, my keynote. And then the last thing I would say is many people have a real life. I call it, we all have a resume, my, my resume, you know, my juggler, Universal Studios, Entertainer of the Year, and nobody cares about my resume. And everyone that's listening, nobody cares about your resume either. But you know what everyone cares about? Your real resume. Who are you really? Yeah. What really motivates you? Why do you want to do what it is you're going to do? And the greatest leaders I've met in my career are the people that don't have amnesia about how they got where they are. Instead, they remind people, hey, I was you. I've been you. I've been, I lived in my car for six weeks. Those are the real amazing leaders that aren't afraid to pretend like they're not saying they're bulletproof. They're, they're people that are open and real, and they want to just share the journey to help as many other people make their dreams come true. So that's your real resume, not your resume. And I recommend people share it more. That's awesome, Curtis. I, I really love your energy. And I can tell you, I, I know exactly where Xenia, Ohio is. My in-laws live in Waynesville, Ohio, which is not too far from there. So I know that little pocket you are in there in Ohio and, and love your energy for sure. You know, going to what you just talked about, I want to dive a little bit deeper. What I understood was three steps, and, and I just want to make sure I got that right, and please correct me if it, it's different, but stop rereading your old scripts, cast your show wisely, which, boy, uh, keeping those crazy makers, uh, giving them fewer lines out of your life, that resonates with me in a big way. I've been impacted by that a couple times, and, and certainly has been a huge life lesson. And then know what the keys to success are, which is know how to fail successfully. That, uh, you know, it's an event, not a person. And you got to write the new script, not the old script. So did I get that correct in terms of the, 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 the premise that you uh, talk about? Absolutely. And, and every one of those things isn't a light switch you flip. Every one of those is a conscious choice and a journey. Yeah. And we have lots of people that when we interact with them, for two days later, we have a stomach ache yeah. because they have an emotional tie on us. And what I'm saying is you need to stop texting those people. You need to stop talking to those people. Or if you live in the house with them or if they're your boss right now for whatever reason, you need to say what it has to happen to have a, a, a really good interaction. And when you walk away, you need to forget about it and let your stomach be normal and not carry that around for two days. Yeah. So it's a mental game as much as it is you truly being the director of your life. Yeah. And wow, take Curtis, how, how do you just forget about it? What do you recommend? Well, well you know, wine is all, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so what, what, I, what I say is this is an e-ticket. Like right now, I'm so excited to be on this show and I want to give everything I possibly have because I can leave this program and go and walk out to the, get the mail and die of a heart attack. And I know that for a fact because a friend of mine had that happen to him. Mm -hmm. So this is not a dress rehearsal, this thing called your life. And we think we have infinite number of days, infinite numbers of days, walking, you know, holding hands on the beach, watching the sunset with the person you love. And I'm telling you right now, the number of minutes we get on the planet is finite. It's finite. And we need to live that way and give everything we can. So when I say let it go, it doesn't mean forget it like it didn't happen. It just means, are you going to let that, it, 
If you've been abused by someone, every time you let that affect your outcomes and your mental state, they're abusing you again. That's my opinion. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying, you know, I tell people all the time, part of my program, I say, Hey, how you doing? Good. How you doing? Good. Before the program, I walk around all the executives. Hey, how you doing today? Good, good. And I say, just so you know, everyone here's a liar. We're at the Marriott having free cold chicken dressed like superstars. And you know how many millions and millions of people on this planet would do anything to trade their life for your life for one week? Millions of people on the planet. And when I say, how you doing? You go, I'm okay, you know, the internet sucks, but I'm all right. Hey, man, you got to let that go, baby. You know, I have so much to say I'm living the dream. Does it mean my life's perfect? No. Does it mean everything I want to have happen? No. But I like the concept of, oh, no, I don't have shoes. Really? That guy doesn't have feet. Oh, I like not having shoes. We have to have some more perspective. And so when people say, Curtis, how you doing? I say, you know what? I'm living the dream. My dream. And I get all different kind of reactions. Some people, I go, I'm living the dream. And they go, oh, yeah, me too, dude. <laughs> right? And other people go, hmm, you know, when I think about it, I really am living the dream. You know, I'm very blessed. I'm very lucky to be in the position I'm in today. So that's how I say you get the mindset of that. Don't be afraid to just, you know, the more people you tell you're living the dream, the more they're going to believe you and get out of your way and let you win. And if you're listening to this, you want to win. So let's get on it. Yeah, that's awesome, Curtis. I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into a few things you said. It strikes me when you first started, because you talked about this at the beginning, you were talking to you know your initial audience, right? Which were, where can you get in, not really mess up too much, learn your ropes. I was the college age students, right? And I can just envision uh, a, a 19, 20, 21 year old getting really motivated by your energy, really motivated by what you have to say. To a certain degree, that was your, I know you said there's never a dress rehearsal, but it was kind of your dress rehearsal because you're kind of like, you know, doing your pitch. But then it probably goes in one ear and out the other because they haven't experienced the pain of maybe a big failure or experienced potentially a situation in business or in life where they have been abused or taken advantage of to realize, oh, that's what that meant. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to, to, to your point, there's the motivation side, then there's really the learnings. And when you say stop rewriting your, uh, rereading your old scripts, and you say as well, you know, if, if you've been abused, every time you think about it, they're abusing it again, but isn't the power of growth learning from those prior relationships. So when you rewrite the next script, you're kind of re, you know, making sure that um, those stories are no longer impacting your life or I'm, I'm just kind of trying to bring the, 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 it all together, I guess, from my perspective, um, experiences really provide this resiliency to when you say cast your show wisely, I kind of know what that means now because I've been burnt. But the 20-year-old, one-year-old may not yet because they haven't gone through that experience as an example. Does that make sense? Wow. Just such a great question. Wow. I, I'm, I'm with you 100%. And I would also say that it depends on what college campus I'm on. And most 2019 kids, 19-year-old students have been through a lot more than, than we think. Sure. And um, especially in the last four years of me presenting on college campuses, I would end my speech and have 20 to 30 students waiting, not because my speech was so much better, but because they're telling me how they're cutting themselves. They're telling me how their best friend was supposed to be there, but he tried to hang himself last week. They're telling me how their mom and dad, finally, I'm going off to college and on the drive here, they told me they're getting a divorce. Because I'm finally going off to college and now they can finally separate and go their own way. Yeah. So the amount of, of things that are on students and the amount of things they're going through is a really heavy lift right now. And um, so the other thing I would say that I didn't share, and that is people change behaviors, not just based on content. We may have all heard this. Knowledge is power. I say that's a total lie. Knowledge for knowledge's sake is called trivia. Knowledge applied is powerful. 
And as an inspirational speaker, what I have to figure out is I'm going to give them the knowledge base, but what am I going to do to activate that? And what activates any movement in anyone is emotion. So I always end my program with after I've been, I call myself speaker boy, and I got on my, my blue blazer with the little handkerchief hanging out and the, you know, I'm speaker boy, I'm up there and I'm, I'm rocking and rolling it. Then I say, a lot of you have done something that I don't want you to do on this campus. I don't want you to do in your company. And that's called projection error. And projection error is when you meet a person and based on your own ideas, just on their outfit, the color of their skin, the size of their body, you think you know them. And that's a total lie. And many of you have done that to me today. And then I share my resume, which is my mother was married six times. I grew up on welfare and food stamps. I'm the youngest of five children and the first one at that time to graduate from high school. I never went to college because I was performing all around the world. And when I first got into the college market, I had all the speakers say, wow, that was a great speech. But you know, you're never going to speak on college campuses. Dr. Will Kime, who spoke to more college students than anyone in the world, took me to the side and said, Curtis, you're going to travel with me for two years. And I'm going to introduce you because you have a message college student need to hear. I'm going to introduce you to every campus you need to know. And two years later, I did more college programs than all those other speakers combined. So I'm saying if you're an entrepreneur, don't think you have to do it by yourself. Don't think you have to go it alone. Be willing to take mentors. And the big thing that with mentorship is people think, great, this amazing person is going to come into my life and they're going to show me the way. It's not the way it really works. This amazing person is going to come into my life and I'm going to add value to their needs. And in return, they're going to help me on my path as well. Yep. So, so to me, the answer to your question is when you get real with college students and you tell them your background and tell them who you really are, then they feel more open. Also, I would say one more thing to answer your question, and that is this. I tell college students, listen, I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm a little envious of you. And that's because no one on this campus knows you. So you can choose to go back and be that obnoxious, out of control senior you were, or that quiet, petite little senior you were, or you can wake up tomorrow morning and you have an amazing opportunity to be anybody you want. Yeah. If You know that person in the back of your head you always wanted to be? Why don't you wake up tomorrow morning and just start being that because nobody knows you? So giving them real tools to think through those kinds of ideas is why now certain college campuses have had me back 13, 14, 15 years in a row yeah. because it's relatable and it is transitional if you give them the content. Yeah, that really connects. And, and I want to just talk a little bit about you mentioned you're an author, you're a keynote speaker, and you're a coach. Uh, if we go to the coaching side of things, you know, the message that you have, I mean, certainly... Uh, should hit people at different times of their phases of their life. It could be the college kid, to your point. It could be the, the you know, mid-age corporate person who's hitting this and realizing, you know what, some of these things apply to me. Uh, but on the coaching side, uh, can you talk to me a little bit about who you're coaching, what kind of coaching uh, service you provide? Absolutely. So again, I think a big mistake is people get into the next stage of whatever it is, and they think they're done. And they think they've, they've, they've achieved whatever their goal was. And so I know lots of keynote speakers that show up, walk on stage, do their speech, walk off stage, get back in their car, go to the airport and fly home. Me, my model was very different. I wanted to get to the conference the day before. I wanted to meet with all of the executive team and listen to what their problems are. I wanted to sit in the morning and listen to the the CEO and the you know chief marketing officer talk about their challenges. And so I also want to watch other presenters. And then that night, if they had an event, I'd go to that event. So doing that literally hundreds and hundreds of times, I got to see lots of different people's idea on what leadership was mm -hmm. and their style and the way they believe you can move people to, to uh, you know, really take in your ideas and then implement them on a, on a big scale. So again, I wasn't doing that to be a coach. I was doing that to be a better keynote speaker. Later in that day, I had three or four notes from each of the things I saw saying, you know how such and such said this, 
Well, that's so true because here's another example where I saw it at another company. So I was able to build on the message. And oftentimes they said, wow, we thought you worked for Crocs. You knew so much about our company. And it was because I spent the time to do that. But the real payoff now in coaching is after learning so many different people's philosophies and how they motivate people. And, you know, how many I, I used to ask every CEO, every every hot shot, you know, he or she, what are your three favorite books? And the number that said good to great as one of their top three books was amazing to me. And so I always wanted to share that. And I read that book over and over and I have it on tape. I listened to it over and over because those core principles can be applied to our small businesses. I don't care if you make $50,000 a year or $50 million running a big company. Principles always work. So if we have those principles, you know, I always say character is so much more important in business than you being sly and working a deal that's going to do something short term, but isn't going to give you long term relationships. So that's the coaching side. So the kind of coaching I do is for like boutique hotels. So there's a place called Anguilla and there's an, it's an island and there's a hotel there uh, called the Cuisinart. And I've been there about five times and I go in and I work with the staff and I do a program, my keynote for everyone, their entire staff. But then while I'm there, I do what are called VIP days. And that's where I spend a whole day with one executive at a time going over their goals, their dreams. And it may be to go work at another hotel. It doesn't matter. But whatever that is. So that's really how the coaching interacts with. It's an add on to the messaging. And once everybody has the same vernacular with, wow, that sounds like an old script. Wow, you may have to cast that show, give them fewer lines. Yep. Hey, as a group, how have we failed and how can we celebrate that rather than beating people up? We want to celebrate it in order to move down the road. So that's really how the, how the coaching goes for me. Um, being willing to put in the extra time. So when I tell people I juggle and I do magic and that sounds great when I'm on stage. They're like, wow, I want to do that. Well, you didn't see the 10,000 hours put in to actually own those skills. And anyone that thinks I want to be an entrepreneur because I want to work two days a week, like the four hour work week, that's what I want to do. So I want to be an entrepreneur. You know what? Uh, don't get into this yeah. because you want to work 90 hours a week and love every single minute. If that's what you want to do, then you're listening to the right podcast. If not, you're not. That's my opinion. Mm. Powerful. I I just want to take a quick step back and re-quote you. You said, knowledge is trivia, knowledge applied is power, and you activate it with emotion. And John referenced it earlier. Curtis, your emotion is just absolutely infectious. And I'm curious, well, I do understand the life that we lead and we're allowed to lead uh, living in America. Uh, in North America, for those of our Canadian friends who are listeners, it's unbelievable in comparison to what else is available in the world. I also have to believe you have days where you have less positive emotion and days where you have more positive emotion. On your days that if we call the less positive emotion days, your off days or your not as good days. What do you do to right size yourself, to get your emotion to where you know it needs to be, where you can perform at your best? Well, again, just fabulous question. And I, and I think it's important that everyone that's listening understands another principle. And that is, I'm going to give you my answer because it's the only answer that I have. But my way isn't the way. And what I always say is when you talk to people and they say their way is the way, you need to run away because that's called a cult leader and that's bad. So I will give you my answer, but it doesn't mean it's going to work for all the listeners. So my answer is I tune into music that really jacks me up. I turn into music that makes me think about when I was 14 and I got my first kiss. I turn into music that reminds me of when the first time it performed on the cruise ship. This is a song I listened to backstage before I went on. And so it helps me celebrate those wins. And all of a sudden my brain shifts 
from whatever I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out about right now onto, wow, you know, if people would just celebrate the things they've done really well and run those tapes through their mind half as much as the seven times they didn't do it well, I think we'd all be better off as human beings. So the music reminds me of those moments. I have a playlist. Now, for somebody else, it may be I need to go for a walk around the block. I need to just, you know, open up my brain, open up my lungs. I might need to get up in the morning and work out, even if I, ha I don't normally work out. So whatever the, they're called triggers, whatever those triggers are for you, we all have triggers that bring us down. We also have triggers that bring us up. Again, I'm the director of my life, so I'm going to intentionally use those triggers to get my mindset where it is. Also, I would just say I have the advantage of being a performer now for 40 years, and that whole thing, the show must go on. I've had lots of different things happen in my life where I had to shut that down and go and get on stage and perform. And I feel like every morning I have the amazing miracle that I get to open my eyes and I get another chance not to suck as bad as I did yesterday. Hey, I want to take this opportunity. So that's the core belief for me. If that answers the question, I'm not sure. But for me, it's more about the listeners. What are the things that make you feel like you're amazing? <laughs> Here's an idea. Do them more often. It's a great idea. Yeah, and I think it doesn't have to be complicated. Really scratching the record, right? What, what, how, what are the triggers that are going to scratch your record and help you get out of that current mindset, kind of push that old script to the side and go, okay, I got to write a new script right now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. I'm going to write the new script right now. Uh, so I appreciate you sharing with that. And I think Richard kind of speaks back to, you know, people have different things, right? For, for Curtis, it's the music that he used to listen to at this specific moment that will rise him up. For certain other people, to your points, different things. And I love um, the idea of using music. It's very you use it very intentionally, right? So you're like, eh, I'm not quite where I need to be. I, I I need a boost. Like you identify that, and you're like, okay, like for you, it's just automatic. You're like, I'm gonna go use music, and the music that you select, I just took a note on. It's from a feel good time in your life when in your life you were casted as the performer for you literally, but for all of us as performers in our own lives, when you were a performer in your life, when it was a feel good time in your past, go tap into that music and take on that feeling and then move forward is what I heard. Absolutely. Little ditty about Jack and Diane. I can't listen to that song and be in a freaking bad mood, man. I just can't. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> you asked um, a bunch of executives, what are your top three books? That clearly, Curtis, prompts a question. What are your top three books? So obviously, After Good to Great. After Good to Great, yeah. So, um, and again, there, there's no, um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, it's interesting, the, the question, that question. And uh uh, I, I love the book, Who Moved My Cheese? And I love that book because right now, millions and millions of people's cheese has been moved. So I really think if you ever, ever heard of that book or you ever had it in the past, I know top executives that right now are giving out copies of that book to other people again. Because we're sniffing around thinking the cheese is going to come back. Oh, the pandemic, it's going to be over in six months, nine months, a year. Listen, a lot of people, your career is gone and it's never, ever, ever coming back. The cheese is gone. So you can head down the hallway and find new doors with new opportunities. And what I always say is if you're going to change your career, why not just double your salary? You got to change your career anyway. Don't go for half. Don't go for the same. What can I do to double my salary? So again, it's the mindset of that. So I love Who Moved My Cheese, especially this time right now. Obviously, I love Life at Performance Level. It's my, my life's work. I'm not going to write 30 books. Like that's the book, right? Um, good to great. I love. Then there are other things like, I don't know. I don't know if you heard of this book. It's called The Bible. So for me, that's one of those top three books for some crazy reason. Everybody, that doesn't mean I want you to read the Bible and now be a believer, but there are some certain principles. 
that I like to take from that to carry around with me. And there are lots of other books that are similar to that. So that would be my, my true honest answer of some of my, my – there's also some books that are called uh, The Millionaire Mind and The Millionaire Next Door. Those are amazing books because it's about a mindset. And as an entrepreneur, you need to have a mindset of plenty because the amount of money in the world is always out there. The amount of opportunity is always out there. So there's plenty in the world for you to get everything you want and still give away what, what you have extra. So you cannot have a mentality of scarcity if you want to be successful as an entrepreneur. And that doesn't just mean money. That means your love. That means your time. That means you're, you're giving to other people. There's plenty of time for you to do that on every, every single interaction if you want to be successful, not just monetarily, but as a human being. Why are you on this planet sucking up the air I need to breathe? And to your point, and that is this whole thing about actualizing things. So I also have a podcast, and that podcast is called The Next 24 Hours. And the reason it's called that is you listen to the podcast and at the end, I reflect on whatever just happened. And then I say, now in the next 24 hours, go do this to actualize the information you just had. And what so many people do is they listen to content and they take it in and then they go back and do exactly what they did before. That's called wasting your time. What are you going to do differently because you listened to this today? If the answer is nothing, stop listening. I'm only doing this right now because I want people to go and change something in their real life, in their relationships, at work, with their self-development. That's why the three of us are taking our time from our lives to be on this program. Is that correct? Would you agree, gentlemen? Well, yeah, absolutely. Stated. I'd love to hear, uh, based on where we are in the, today's conversation, it, in your podcast, uh, is it do you leave your guests with one thing you believe they should do in the next 24 hours? Or do you challenge them to take something from the podcast and go do it in the next 24 hours? I challenge the listeners with the content and the strategies and the things that either I'm sharing. Lots of times it's just me. Yeah. Other times I have guests on. And, um, you know, part of my problem with the pandemic was there were so many things that were much more important than what I was doing, in my opinion. So I took a break away from it, and we're just gearing up back up into it. And anyone who's listening that feels like, oh man, my life, and this is horrible, and the pandemic, and I've been locked down, and I have, the, I have a quick thing I want to share with everyone, and that's this. I make money, and I call that earning my rice. I earn rice to feed my family when I'm on stage. And for the past nine months, they've not been putting 2,000 people in a room. I've not done one live program. So I have choices then. I can do Zoom calls and I can do executive coaching, but that's not my jam. I don't get into that's not, I don't get off of that and go, yeah, that was amazing. Like when I'm on stage, I'm like a live performer kind of guy. So a lot of my friends set up a studio in their basement and they're doing Zoom calls, and that's great. But that's not for me. So I had to decide, well, what am I going to do? So here's a pivot point. I'm here. I'm in the basement. I get out my cards from one, you know, 20 years ago, I used to collect baseball cards. And I'm a huge Michael Jordan fan. I collected cards. And slowly, I got into it more and more and more. So I'm here to just announce when you're the, one of the first, pe first people to hear it. A month ago... I bought one of the largest sports and memorabilia collections in the United States. Wow. So I didn't do that because I'm changing careers. I'm doing that because it jacks me up. I love cards. I love sports. I love, you know, flipping cards. And, and I always want to have a friend in the card business, and I never did. I want to be that guy for as many people as possible. So I've been up at 5 o'clock in the morning and going to bed at 10 o'clock at night. My basement's full of cards right now that I'm looking through. I bought over a million individual cards and 300 cases of unopened sports cards, plus over a million pieces of other memorabilia. And I did that because I needed to be passionate and I needed to pivot. And I know that I can sell all of this stuff probably in the next year. And in about a year, guess what? 
people are going to start putting a thousand people back in a room again. And I can go back to that career. But in the meantime, I have a reason to get up in the morning and not sit in my underwear for seven more months going, oh, my God, there's no jobs. <laughs> Let it go. What do you love? And freaking go for it. It's still out there. That's my challenge to everybody. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. It really talks to your perspective which I think a lot of what we talked about today as well is your perspective. You can either have this perspective or that perspective. Your perspective is amazing. And the fact that you keep reinventing yourself as an entrepreneur, uh, I will challenge you on one thing. I think your virtual performance skills are incredible. Uh, and I think that it really does respond. I understand you like the stage aspect of it, but you know, sitting here and listening to you today, I mean, I got tons of energy and I'm, I'm going to be leaving this conversation with a ton of it. You could do this for thousands of people here as well. And and that may be a pivot that I encourage you to maybe look at from a challenge back to you in the coming few months is to maybe put yourself in that environment where you are impacting people still by the thousands from the comfort of your sports card basement. I appreciate it. And if you want to set those up, I'll, I'll show up. <laughs> <laughs> I I, I, again, for me, it's just about, you know, people always say, do what you love. And what I love is making people laugh, making people experience things, being, you know, I've been a performer my whole life, getting that feedback from the audience and doing Zoom calls with 500 people. I'm not saying I haven't done them. I have. And, you know, half of them are on their phone or they, they take, and take their picture off. Or, and that's not the kind of guy I am. I mean, I start my speech with, here's the deal. I'm away from my family for two days to be in front of you for the next hour. So that means if while I'm up here talking, if you're on your phone, I will jump off the stage and get in your face because I love you and I love your organization, but I love my family more. And I gave up two days of raising my kids. So please, I have some real information for you to listen to. So I think it's really important that people understand what you're doing by doing this podcast. You're not just doing it because you're a hell of a nice guy. You're doing both of you are doing it because you want to give back. But it means you have to make choices. You're not doing something today to make yourself money necessarily because you want to help others do that. So I want to listen intently to these kinds of programs as a thank you to both of you for what it is you're giving. And that doesn't always happen when your boss makes you listen to the 13th hour of Zoom calls and speaker boy comes on going, hey, you're living the dream. I'm really not. I hate my life. I'm on Zoom calls all day. What are you talking about? So certain mountains I just don't want to push against that's uh, you know I'm going to be totally honest yeah thanks for the perspective on that I when you talked about pivot point and then I took a note on a passionate pivot not just a pivot but a passionate pivot and then you talked about getting clarity on what you love what about for the the listeners or again YouTube viewers that go man I I'd love to get clarity on what I love. I'm just not sure I'm clear. Do you have any guidance for those people on how do you go about getting clarity on what you just absolutely love for your passionate pivot? Well, so this is a huge problem for everyone. So executives, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, young moms trying to figure out now, what am I going to do at home when I've been doing, you know, so, uh, and it comes back. So this isn't one of those you answer it and then you're good forever. It doesn't work that way. It keep that question keeps coming back. And one thing I would have to just say to people is, um, most of the people I coach, I tell them in the first half an hour, just so you know, for what it is you think you want to do, you're already overqualified. Don't take another class. Don't ask your grandma one more time. Don't get feedback from your friends. You don't have to go and listen to 15 more audiobooks. You are so overqualified. And I would say this, and I say it all the time, passion supersedes natural ability. Passion supersedes natural ability. You know, there's this uh, misunderstanding that the reason I can juggle five balls is because I'm gifted, because I'm talented, because I have something that you don't, and that's a total lie. All it means is I've dropped the ball thousands and thousands and thousands of times more than you have. And every time I did, I went, oh, I roll at juggling, even though I just dropped the ball. 
But that mindset kept the passion going, which helped me achieve my goal. So find, people spend 15 years finding out what their mission is. If they went on a path and let the path take them, they would be already where they want to be in five years. So stop debating over the perfect tchotchke to make or the perfect marketing plan or the per just do something and then let that evolve. If you're if you're authentic and you love it, other people are going to feel it. If you kind of love it and it's well, I'm trying this, they're going to know. So stop worrying about the specific thing and pick one thing and then do it well. Does that answer the question? Yeah, get on the path and let it take you. Absolutely. So in closing, would love to hear from you what your recommendation would be after you, you've considered the content that we've been able to cover in the last 45 minutes or so. What's the next 24 hours for our listeners that you might distill and recommend? So, well, honestly, my biggest recommendation is every time I give a speech, every time I have an interaction is every single person hears something different. So one person will come up and say, oh, wow, that, that rewriting scripts things, I really need to work on that. Failing, I hate to fail. I really need, oh, you know, I have to write my boyfriend out because, you know, this, the reason I have sunglasses on is because he slapped me in the head last night. So everybody hears something different. So my recommendation is if you didn't jot down a few notes during this program, go back and maybe fast forward and run it double time and pick a couple things that resonated with you and then think about what am I going to do tomorrow morning, first thing, to help actualize one of those things, to help bring that into my life in a big way. And so it's not about a specific because I want you to pick. You're the director of your life. So I want you to pick the thing that resonated with you. And then I would also just say one of my, my biggest things is share it. Don't, you know, don't isolate it to I'm going to do this for me. No, how, who else can I share this with? You know, you guys have been doing this for quite a while. And if people are listening and taking it to themselves, but they're not sharing it, and they're not saying, wow, you know, my uncle Stan really needs to listen to this podcast because he's been trying to be an entrepreneur. Who are you giving away your knowledge to? Who are you sharing it with? Because that really is the thing that is the most value of all, helping other people along the journey. Because I always say, you never want to be at the top and you never want to be at the bottom when it comes to mentorship. You want to be right in the middle. That means I'm mentoring two or three people, and I always have one or two people that are helping me along the way. You never get to the top. You always want to be in that middle place because that means you're still growing and you're still helping. So those would be a few things I would say people could think about over the next 24 hours. What resonated? What are you going to do tomorrow? Share it. Curtis, thank you for your time today. Very powerful message. Appreciate it so much. Thanks for being on. My honor to be here, and I just got to thank you both again for the time you're spending to bring some perspective for people to help them along their journey. I know it's with an open heart, so I really appreciate both of you. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Curtis. Love the energy. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with us for a few more minutes while Rich and I break down the podcast. John, we ended on go on the path, let it take you where it's going to take you, and evolve. I got to say there are two guests that that ending made me think of. The first one was the go on the path and, and just go. C-Rock, who talked about just commit and your commitment will create creativity. Like just commit, just start doing something. Stop planning, just commit and go. And then obviously the let it evolve would connect me with Andre Young. On yeah. you evolving now and the just the evolution of who you are. And I feel like Curtis really reinforced that messaging in his own unique way that connected with me, certainly. Yeah. I want to ask a question of you. I know that we've always had this thing amongst us as our yin and yang, if you will, was I'm the ready, fire, aim guy, and you're the ready, aim, 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 yeah. aim guy. Yeah. It's interesting because C-Rock and I think Curtis would say, just do it, just go. 
And some of this might be challenging your psyche a little bit on that. Do you evolve now or do you keep researching or do you keep, you know, I'm curious as to how you're responding to that. Really well. I'd say one of the things that happened in the pandemic was it required myself and my team to respond really quickly to provide some tools and some guidance on leadership and people and uh, leading yourself first and then leading your family and then leading your team and then leading your whole business. And I was uncomfortable with how quick we needed to roll things out, but we did. And guess what? It was a knockout. It went really well. So I feel like I, as I continue to evolve as a leader, I continue to press on uh, speed and trusting that if it doesn't go well, I'm still okay. I'll figure it out. I'll make it go better. Um, and most of the time it goes better than sometimes my gut would say, because I do sometimes want to over perfect. So I'd yeah. say it's landing really well. And I've had a positive few experiences in the last year or so. Yeah, that's awesome. I completely loved Curtis's energy. I know I said it like about a dozen times already, but it was definitely infectious to hear totally. where he is. And and it, it reminds me, you mentioned a couple of podcasts of Michael Alasso, right? They're both actors and producers. He was he was definitely acting to his objective, not his obstacle, just like we talked about with Michael Alasso. And, and I love his message. I love what he talks about. And there's one message in particular that I think hit me you know, pretty squarely. And it's really, if you've been hurt or if you've failed at something or whatever it may be, you need to take the learnings from it. But every time you think about it in a negative way and you keep rereading that script, it just hurts you again and again and again. Yeah. You know, you got to take those learnings because knowledge is trivia, but knowledge applied is, Power. right, is, is powerful. And yeah. it's that emotion. And then I brought all that all the way back to cast your show wisely, right? Um, and I, I don't care if it's a podcast and who I want to do this podcast with, which was you, right? I want to do this podcast with you. I want to cast this show. But it really, if you think about your business, the people you're hiring, the friends you hang around with, you know, all those things are so powerful because a lot of us have had failed relationships along the way. And you have to take the learning from it, rewrite a new script, take that knowledge, apply it, and then cast your show again. And, and so for me, that really hit me, the, that linkage between those three things. No, the, another one that hit me was on the using music very intentionally. And this is, uh, I think it was either second podcast in a row, or maybe it was uh, the one previously that you had said, scratch the record. Yep. And you and I have a bit of a history on the scratch a record. I think that came from Tony Robbins on his personal power stuff that you and I in Illinois, when we used to live together and ran a business together. And do you remember what we would do? And, and sometimes on our way to Applebee's restaurant, do you remember what we would do when we weren't in the best of moods? I could have something to do with putting our windows down in the car and yelling out the window. Yeah, we would <laughs> roll our window. We'd challenge each other to roll our windows down. And if one of us was kind of in a funk, we'd be like, Dude, roll your window down right now and scream, I love life at the top of your lungs. <laughs> and then whoever was being challenged, you'd roll your window and be like, I love life. And then we'd crank the music and you know, we'd find a Rocky theme song or we'd find some type of music and we'd just jam out to the music, right? So this whole idea of if, if we feel like we're in a funk and we're not bringing the energy that we want to for it, being really intentional about acting differently and using music and that is going to elevate how we approach the rest of our day. I, I love that. I think it's a great highlight. You and I have used it in the past. I'm going to look to use it in the future a little bit more. I ought to be 20 again. You know? Right? <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think the, the last piece I'll share on this one, that I love the theme of his podcast, the next 24 hours. One of the things, Rich, you know, obviously we're trying to do this podcast to educate ourselves, impact others. There's been a f many situations uh, through the 20 some podcasts we've had that I've been impacted in, in terms of doing something about it, not just listening and going, oh, that's good content and moving on. Um, Dr. Julie Bell was a 20 minute thinking time that I do now every day yeah. as, as just one example of it or our end of year talk when I said I'm going to commit to this one uh, thing planner and commit to that. And I do that every single day now. And some of these things have changed the, the way that I live. Uh, and so one of the 
things I think we should think about is what are you and I going to take away in the next 24 hours to actually act on from this conversation? Mm -hmm. But then also, as we conclude each podcast, maybe that's a theme we continue. And not to steal his 24 hours, but you know, with Dr. Julie Bell say, let's do this for the next two weeks. So let's, let's do that uh, type of new process. So I think that's something we should consider uh, as something more actionable. Well, I'll tell you one thing I'm going to do right off the bat uh, that I'm going to act on is I'm going to use music. Uh, in my morning, more intentionally, I often don't listen to music in the morning. I'm going to start, I'll make a commitment right now and says, hey, for the next week, uh, after I do my morning routine, I'm going to play at least one song, maybe two, that really remind me of times in my life where it was a feel good time to get back in touch with that, to bring that type of energy to the rest of my day. I'm happy to do that and report back on it. Love it. I feel like saying I'm going to do the same things. I love yours so much. And then you can. Right now you're listening to too many podcasts. I listen to a whole bunch of, but, but very infrequently do I actually just blast the radio and let loose, you know, for, and just for five feel. minutes. Just feel. Yep. All right, let's do that. Next two weeks, blast the radio for at least five minutes every two morning weeks. after a morning routine. Do we? I committed to one, but now you're stretching it to two. I'm in. Right. I'm going to see rocket. I'm in. I'm committing. Right. Little ditty. <laughs> Jack and Diane. That's great. All right, buddy. Growing up in the heart.